great. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. Um, this is a session, as you know, about protecting our children, uh, which, um, if, you're, if you're here, I'm guessing you know what protecting our children was. Um, it was, for me, the standout um, documentary series of the last, well, I was going to say 18 months, but probably for, for several years, in my opinion. I thought it was an absolutely brilliant piece of work. And uh, I'm really delighted to be able to um, sit and chat uh, with, along with you, with three of the people involved with this. Um, Sasha Mertzoff is the uh, director of the series. Um, he's currently escaping the, um, <laughs> the horror of making Protecting Our Children by wandering around in Canada, um, shooting bears and that kind of thing. Uh, prior to doing... Oh, well... Filming bears. Yeah. <laughs> shooting with exactly. a camera. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, before that, he was he did various things uh, with, in Bristol, including wandering up and down uh, Mount Kilimanjaro with Cheryl Cole, <coughs> Gary Barlow, and Chris Moyles, um, and Charles Darwin's Tree of Life with David Attenborough. So, an eclectic filmmaker, I think. Um, Petra Graff, on the other hand, is a very highly respected and, and renowned cinematographer. Um, who's done work such as uh, Staying Lost, Wasted, um, Greater Ormond Street. And uh, Sasha and I were talking earlier on, and uh, Sasha said Petra's probably the most experienced film f photographer of, of this kind of work, of dealing in this, these sensitive areas um, uh, in the, working in the UK today. And also just, just stunning photography, I have to say. Um, and... Ben, uh, Crank, 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 Crank. So, sorry, I, I, bang. I nearly said Craig again because I wrote it down wrong and that was really badly prepared of me, uh, is a senior practitioner um, in, with Bristol Social Services and uh, is in the series and we're going to see clips of, of Ben in action uh, shortly. So ladies and gentlemen, this is your panel. Um, and to get us going, we're going to see a little <coughs> clip which is the the pre-title of the third episode, third and last episode, just to give you a feel of, of uh, what we're going to be talking about. So can we run the first clip, please? It makes my day a lot when I see my daughter. Hello. Rissy, <laughs> Rissy. <laughs> Where's my limb? You can have those baffles this morning. Society in general do not want to know or accept that children suffer. Um, that's very good. Every day in this office, in the offices across the country, thousands of good decisions are made that protect thousands of children from harm. But it's completely invisible to the general public. Last year, social workers took nearly 10,000 children into care in England alone. When the risk is immediate, there's no choice. But often it is a more difficult judgment. I want my baby back as a baby, Louise. I didn't want her back when she looked too. But all the time, it's about risk <coughs> assessing the household. Is this child at risk? If so, who from, what from? and are we able to put in a safety plan or do we need to remove the child? People don't realise they're actually trying to save children's lives in some cases. For the past year, social workers in Bristol have been filmed dealing with these complex issues. <clears throat> when is it right to remove children? And when is it safe to let them go home? So, Sasha, Com there said, for the past year, the BBC's been filmed. So it only took you a year to make it? Uh, no, far more. Um, it took, we probably filmed for about 18 months, but the whole process of getting it started was, um, was long and drawn out. It probably took over well over a year before we got into a position of even being able to begin the production. And so after the baby Peter Connolly crisis, there was a commissioning team looked at trying to get access to social workers. 
And there had been a series done in Bristol before called Someone to Watch Over Me. And um, so there was good, still, good relations with the council. But that process of just dealing with actually how we would work with the children and getting what we call this working protocol, this legal agreement between the BBC and the council took the best part of a year just to flash out about how. And we landed up with, I think it was a, you know, something like a 15-page document, which we had no idea what the ramifications of how important that would be over the course of our filming. We landed up going to court. I probably attended court over 30 times in the course of the production and, and officially representing the BBC w with legal aid, obviously. Um, probably best part of 10 times. And each those phrases, the individual phrases in that protocol became just so fundamental. And it was, it's, it's a kind of strange thing. You don't realize at the beginning quite how important that's going to be. So, so about a year to set up, about 18 months to film, and it kind of goes on. It's one of those productions that doesn't just end and you've, you know, you, you're done with your contributors. We've, part of working with children is that, you know, we have to think about their future and we've got, you know, we've prepared long, detailed things for them in their future lives so that they can understand what's, you know, some of the children are very young and it's, kind of just happened to them. And so it's important at a later stage that they understand that process. And, and uh, that's, that, that's been quite interesting. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a long process. You say, you say quite a lot of the, the uh, contributors, obviously, the children are very young. Ben, as a social worker, how can you possibly <coughs> justify the level of intrusion into your clients' lives that putting them up on the BBC entails? I think in terms of the children and families, that preparatory work was done by Sasha and his colleagues and our legal team and our senior managers and so on. And that was such a painstaking process. There was so much in place ethically that um, by the time they came to us to film, um, we felt comfortable that there were safeguards in place. So I was then comfortable going out with the crew and, and trying to get them as much access as possible. Um, because I felt there were very good safeguards in place in terms of to protect the families, the identity of the children and so on. And were all the social workers equally happy to take part? Uh, no. Um, we got a choice, really. You could be, you choose not to take part, you could be neutral and you could be uh, a willing volunteer. And to begin with, I was neutral. I think um, social work in general doesn't, <coughs> hasn't enjoyed its experience of the media in the past and so our natural position is to be slightly suspicious if not uh, you know a bit more hostile but um, as we got to know them um, we felt that it was a long-term project it didn't really feel like there would be a, an interest for anyone to invest that much time to do a stitch up job if you like so um, we, we relaxed and then I felt very comfortable then in um, the project I, I was very enthusiastic about supporting it because um, I I'm very interested in the public understanding what we do, really, rather than the way that we've been traditionally portrayed in the press. And so in <coughs> terms of that, that, that trust building process, Sasha, uh, can you just tell, tell us a little bit about this next clip um, that involves Ben and, and how the trust had been built? So I, th I think, well, to start with, some of, the, some of the details of that protocol, that working agreement, was that people could withdraw their consent at any time. So it wasn't about us saying, do you want to take part, and them going yes or no. And that, that went up until transmission. So it was throughout the whole process, they watched the films, and even after, they had the ability to say, look, we don't, we don't think this is in our best interest, or indeed any professionals working with them. So a family might, might be very interested, but a judge or a guardian or a social worker or anyone could say, we don't think this is right, and then we stopped. That was, that was the agreement. And so it, it relied completely on us all being able to be completely open and honest, but maintain good relations. And, and in terms of that, you say they can withdraw consent at any time. Yeah. So the publicity, the pre-publicity for the, for the, I mean, it's very well publicised, the mm -hmm. series. It got lots of press coverage mm -hmm. and there were trails on BBC One. So uh, 
in that run-up were the jitters? Did, were the times jitters. where people were, you were thinking you might have to pull a film? Uh, on one of the films, which was going out on Monday, on Friday, I was uh, in deep discussion. I, was stu I was, had been invited to go to an awards ceremony and thinking I'm having a lovely evening out and uh, got stuck on the M4 and was in deep discussion with lawyers about one of the films being withdrawn. And, so, and it turned out to be a storm in a teacup, that. But absolutely until the very, very last moment. And, and you know, it's, it, that's the nature of this kind of thing, though. You have to be able to... And we would have honoured it if people had genuinely, um, in this case, it was a professional worker who was new to one of our contributors <coughs> who had just found out we were working with them and understandably just thought, hold on, what do you mean that vulnerable woman is involved in a film and nobody's told me, I don't think this is a good idea. The social worker concern was on holiday at that time and it went to the council and it went upstairs very quickly and then it went to the head of our legal team and it was suddenly, whoa, we've got a huge issue. Turned out to be uh, fine, but yeah, no, it was very much, um, very much, you know, having to having to deal with people from all the way from judges all the way down to, um, you know, individual families and and <coughs> make sure that everyone felt content. And I think hopefully what we aim to do, and I don't know if we achieved it, is to tell everyone's story relatively faithfully that they feel that they're represented well and that was important for us that we didn't just it wasn't just about social workers and their work but you also understand the the trials and tribulations of the families and understand their their particular background so you turn up and you've got you you're going to start filming with or you're hoping to start filming with social workers and they say like ben described the you know well hang on we've had pretty bad publicity in the past mm -hmm. you're more media types you just want to stitch us up mm -hmm. How do you win their trust? Slowly. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's by, it's, straight, it's just being open and honest and straightforward and giving people the chance to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. And people have different motivations and different reasons for wanting to take part. Some people felt that perhaps social <coughs> services were... Um, you know, that they, they, they had this massive injustice that was being done to them, and wouldn't it be great if there's an objective, independent um, crew there to witness what was going on? Other people felt they were on the kind of road to recovery in many senses and felt that they wouldn't this be good and helpful for other people to go on record as testament. Um, it varied. Some, some contributors I still don't quite understand why we took part. It's, it's really, you know, but, it, but we felt very strongly it should be down to the <coughs> individual. They should be given that chance. And I think often in this kind of, you know, when you're dealing in, often people make decisions for other people. And that, it really irritates me that, 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 well, they could never possibly, why would they, that they don't know what they're saying when they, when they say they want to take part in that film. And I feel that's really disrespectful. I think it's, you know, people can make informed choices, but it's our duty absolutely to, to make sure they understand that. And we did that on many occasions, recorded time and time again, the whole consent process. So we had a record that they actually understood what we were talking about <coughs> and could, could realize the ramifications of what might happen in their lives by taking part and how that can affect them. And, you know, that was very much our duty. Okay. Yeah. So let's have a look at the outcome of some of that trust building uh, with the next sequence, just a sequence we'll discuss in a sec. You're either going to pack and come with us, or we're going to have a load of police in here who are going to remove your baby and take him into foster care. That's what will happen. Come on then, start getting some things together. No, I'm telling you to get out of my flat. Okay. I think that's a decision. If you're not going to listen to us, we'll, we'll make a choice. We're going to have to be there, <coughs> so I think that's where we're going. Leave my baby! I'll speak too late. <coughs> that's a little bit unconventional, but can we, one of you perhaps come with me? Can I go up now or not? Um, I wouldn't at the minute. She, she couldn't... She couldn't Accept that you know she had to leave, and um, you know she couldn't accept any of the choices. So it became a bit. 
um, emotional. So we just had to take the baby, you know, sometimes we've got no choice. She'd been drinking, it just became increasingly clear she wasn't going to be able to, um, you know, make an informed decision and, you know, do the right thing. So, you know, this is one of those instances where, you know, you have to do an extremely difficult thing. James, I tried ringing. Got a little visitor. This is being... They just peeped in. Where's Mum? Um, back at the flat, being restrained. So, Ben, um, that's <clears throat> kind of the Daily Mail version of social work, isn't it? You walk <laughs> in, you snatch a child, and you walk out, and the woman's screaming. Does, what, did you, did you have, did you, were you worried about that? Did, were you, did you have doubts about them allowing them to film that and use it? No, I'm, I'm very glad they did, and shame on the Daily Mail if they'd have left the child there with a paedophile. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's one of those times when you're faced with a critical choice, you know, and, and the child's safety comes first, and, and that's as simple as that. So um, that's what we do sometimes. Um, that's what we do um, on behalf of the public, and I think there's a wider point about this film being in the public interest, because um, I think the public need to know what we do and why we do it and the circumstances in which we do it, and the thinking behind it. And um, at the end of the day, that child was at um, high risk of being sexually abused by a known paedophile. So mother wouldn't accept um, our um, offers of a refuge or putting her up in a B&B somewhere else in the, in the city or going to stay with a relative. She didn't accept the risk from this man. Um, and we spent 40 minutes, you don't get that from that clip, but we spent 40 minutes trying to persuade her to, to come away and, you know, we wanted to protect both of them, but ultimately that wasn't going to happen because of her, um, you know, under the influence of alcohol and not accepting the risk. So, Petra, thinking about covering a, a scene like that, you're in the car on the way there, you vaguely know there's a, a known paedophile in the house, you're probably not going to be able to show the face of the paedophile, you're probably not going to get, and indeed didn't get into the house, but it's an incredibly dramatic scene, and it comes over as a very dramatic scene, although we don't see most of it, most of the action. So how, how do you go, go about covering With the flow. like that? <laughs> With the flow, I mean, it was very surprising. We had a basic idea, but uh, when Ben came down with a child and, and just, you know... I see put the child next to me <laughs> in the car and, say, and I just, at one point, I even had to put the camera down just holding the child and it was just very, very <coughs> unconventional, yeah, as you said. <laughs> but you just, you just, it just develops in front of you and you follow. And uh, uh, very emotional, my heart was racing, very much so, and, uh, and we followed all day long and it was... A hell of a day. We felt all emotionally very exhausted mm. in the evening. I think we yeah. filmed for about six hours straight that straight day. Straight on. And we went to the office to, mm. to get a pickup line with Ben. We, 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 went, we had no idea it was going to happen. We, we were covering another story with Ben, which is a great story. And never made the series. And we worked, we filmed, I think it was about eight months, that story. <coughs> and it landed up in criminal court and we couldn't use it. But it meant by the time that that happened, we'd worked so long with Ben that he just was like, oh, this is happening, you might want to come along. But if that had been our first days filming with you, there's no way, I'm sure we wouldn't have felt like, well, you know, comfortable, you wouldn't have felt comfortable. Mm -hmm. But that process where he, we had, you know, all, although that story never made it, it was actually a good thing that we'd done all that because, you know, we could, we could go ahead and do that mm -hmm. with you feeling comfortable and us knowing <coughs> how to how to act around you. But it's physically, I mean, handheld for six hours. Oof, I forget it's a lot about of work. it. You forget about it, then. But yeah. you forget about it because... <laughs> <laughs> do you... You're talking about six hours there, do you? And that was one of the, one of the stories you were able to use. Do you have any idea what your ratio was? I'm it must have been shot. high. It must have been high. We've, we've filmed probably six, seven months before... We used, we had anything. I remember the day, Petra said, I've got a GV that's going to be in series. It's great, we've got a shot. 
And it was, you know, and Charlotte, to her great credit, was enormously patient with us, and we wasn't, you know, and we always felt like, oh my God, we're not going to even, we're not going to be able to fill the series. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it was just quite, you know, but, you know, we were all, right, we'll just stick at it, we'll just keep, 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 and then when they started coming, they started coming thick and fast, and it was good, but you couldn't have done it without that process of building up trust and understanding and relationships, and, um, so, yeah. And just thinking about that scene we've just seen, in terms of, you know, the, the, the kind of things that are going through your head as a director about compliance and legal yeah. and so on and so forth, you've got... A, a woman inside, you've got a, a paedophile outside, he wanted to be filmed, didn't he? Yeah, he wanted to be identified, and of course we're not legally able to do that because he would be uh, victimised. And so we had the kind of <coughs> ironic situation where we would have loved, loved to film with mum, but she felt, understandably, she didn't want to be filmed, and, and we didn't go into the flat. And then he, we waited outside while Ben did his work, and then he was really keen to have an interview and explain his side of the... And so it's a quite surreal situation where you're finding yourself just thrust into a situation that's very... Even as the car pulled up, I mean, we pulled up and thought we'd have time to assess the situation and discuss, you know, and we had discussed, but it was fast and it all went very quickly. And as the car pulls up, it's in the film. He's just standing on the pavement right there. And, and then it's, hello, are you so-and-so? And boom, we're straight into it. And, a, you know, and it didn't stop <coughs> until the child was placed in foster care safely that night and uh, a very intense experience and you kind of are after that you know and as with all good observational filming when it's happening you know it's happening and you're getting it it's just like it's this amazing kind of you know we, we didn't speak all day we didn't have to say a word to each other but we're just filming 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 and then finally we leave the foster care's house that night and there's oh, Big we need to go and have a drink <laughs> now. You know, we need to go, and then it all comes out. And you kind of, but it's very, you know, it, it's it's the legals of that were very complicated because it's um, yeah, it was it was difficult. But we had the most amazing legal support actually, and I think without that, it would have been very very difficult. And were the police on site when you were out? So yeah, out? absolutely. So the police, we, we had to have so part of the access to give you an idea of the kinds of. The, who we had to deal with for, before we could begin, why it took a year to set up in the beginning. So obviously we've got the social workers and the council, then we've got to deal with the police and there's a specific child abuse investigation team, get access with them and they would understand what we're doing. Two NHS trusts in Bristol, the education board, all of the schools, the health workers, CAFCAS, who are these, the guardians appointed by the court. Every one of these institutions have got their own issues about, you know, to have, get access to one of these places, to just film in a hospital, <coughs> as, you, as you would know. Just difficult. To, to have all of these on the go at, at once was just immensely difficult. And so with the police, we did have agreements in place, and it was all fine and good, but we hadn't filmed with those two individuals who turned up. And so, um, and as it happened, as it happened on the day, we were there ahead of them, and... So when they turned up, it was like, whoa, what's going on here? You know, but they were fine with it. It was all good and fine. But it, um, yeah. But that access, that sorting that out at the front was absolutely essential. Without that, it would have stopped there and then they would have come up and thought, what's going on, forget it. You know? But we had time to make phone calls before on the journey over saying, we will be there, this will be happening. So, you know. But you need those agreements in place. Mm. So that, oh, yeah, a question. Of course. Mm. Well, it's a very grey area. It's an interesting area. <clears throat> and it wasn't one in which we were sure that we would be able to use it. And so it's very clear that if we had been filming in their home, we'd, that's an invasion of privacy, obviously, because she, is, she is, has stated very clearly she doesn't want to be filmed in her house. But Ben has a radio mic on, and we've been recording him in the car and across the way. And... Are recording it and, and need to record it, I would say, very clearly, because it's a, it's a, we need a record of what's gone on there because it is a, it's a high tension situation, and then for our own protection as much as anything else, we have to record that. And so, as it turned out, in the end, what we did, and hopefully none of you noticed, but the mother's voice, we landed up changing in the, so as a way of protecting her. So she had a very distinct accent, and we ended up re-recording 
her words, but keeping her exactly what she said as was in the same timing in the same spaces. And, um, and that was a way of satisfying the legals that there. But it was unclear at first whether we would be able to use that audio or not. And in terms of that, in terms of re replacing her voice, mm -hmm. was there a discussion in, about safeguarding trust and whether or not that needed to be, you know, the caption needed to pop up or something like that? Well, we went through editorial policy and legals for that, and actually turned out that it's quite interesting. There's a number of instances across the series where, um, by laying a kind of false trail, you land up protecting people more. And so, if you highlight the fact that there's a change, you're actually drawing the audience's yeah. attention to it, and so it actually, for their own protection, you're doing them more damage than good, ironically, even though, you know, it, it would be, it's not strictly, if you just follow the, 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 the complete letter of how it's laid out, you wouldn't think that that's the case. And so several times we laid, you know, false paths so that, you know, if a neighbour thought, was that that person, or maybe that we'd say they've got a different number of children, or they've got a, you know, something that would always spend a load of time recolouring their front door so that, you know, well, it can't be that house because... So all dotted through, we've spent ages and last stages of post just kind of cleaning up and making sure that... And that's a long process, yeah. So um, that's obviously a very kind of high-energy, tense, dramatic scene. The next scene we're going to show you is uh, almost the opposite end of the spectrum, um, <coughs> where it's very contained, very quiet, but incredibly telling. Can we run the next clip, please? Mike's contact is being assessed by The Guardian, a child expert appointed by the court to help determine whether Toby <coughs> should return home. thought as a parent you could probably make a bit more effort if you like to, to interact get down on his level play with him on the floor suggest some toys bring some things out for him that sort of thing i wrote down in my notes that it was 45 minutes before you got up off the couch amazing scene that <laughs> incredible 
Petra, when you when you're in a room like that, presumably it's quite a small room that you're in, mm. and you've got that unfolding. I mean, from a technical point of view, I think what's brilliant about that scene is it just looks like it's two camera coverage because you've got these extraordinary, very slight reactions of, of, of the guy doing this at the Guardian, and you know when he's looking down and writing, and the slight sort of twitches of the eyes, and at the same time you're also getting the the you know the problems that are very apparent. So how do you make those decisions? Is it just instinct? I think often it's instinct, of course it is, but uh, you, you watch, you observe, you listen, and um, then, yeah, I just, uh, I felt so known by this time, I known them both, the whole family for quite a while, and um, I found it just incredibly sad, that scene, very, very sad, and at the time, even angry, actually, and I think you <clears throat> you watch this all with um, developing in front of you emotion, with your own emotions and then you just follow it. And uh, at that point, you often <coughs> you don't even move much physically. You just try to cover it from. I often use a long lens rather than wide angle, so and I try to cover it. Oh yeah, very. Sometimes I move a tiny bit, but it depends. What Petra has in great abundance, she has this amazing capacity, I'm sorry I'm getting embarrassed here now, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's that in the middle of chaos, when it's all kicking off, when things are happening in a very intense, this isn't, you know, this is more, I think the space in this is absolutely beautiful, and I think you get the, diff the relationships of, and the nuances of what's happening in that triangle of relationships there is, is amazing in this, but when it's, when it's really kicking off, you have this capacity to be able to just quietly move in the middle of it all, be right there in the middle of all while it's all kicking, and people just get on with it. And that's an amazing skill, it's amazing kind of, you know, you've got the confidence to be able to, a lot of people would be, ah, I can't do anything, you know, and we've had, we had some AP shooting on the suit, we couldn't afford Petra for the whole time. <laughs> but, um, and in some very high tension, kind of extremely emotional situations, a lot of the less experienced people will kind of, because it's also energetic and, and people are freaking out, that they have that same reaction, that they land up <gasps> with the camera all over the place and kind of feeling, and what you're brilliant at is holding and keeping the air and, and if you need to move, quietly moving and people just get on with that. And that's, it's a real skill, it's an amazing skill and it's wonderful to watch and it's silent and it just goes on and people, Get on with it. I think that, uh, the silence is, I mean, that's, you know, I don't know what that clip was about three minutes with pretty much no dialogue. You know, you're just watching it, it's just mm. unfolding beautifully in front of you. Then, from a, from a social work point of view, a scene like that, the father is quite obviously digging his own grave to, mm. to the audience. Mm. You know, the audience is going, oh my God, this mm. you know, is, is clearly failing whatever test is, is, yeah. is being set. And so, can't really, can it really be in his interests for the whole nation to see what a terrible parent he is? I think, again, it is a public interest argument mm. because this is showing, you know, the kind of families we deal with and um, what we do and, um, it, you know, very clearly there, there's a, there's a father who is, as you say, digging his own grave. Um, people had their own reasons for consenting and I don't, you know, like Sasha, I don't know what the, you know, the, the true uh, reasons for them agreeing to and everyone's, almost everyone's um, uh, reaction is not to agree and that's why the project took so long and I guess is, is because you had to find those cases where you would get that consent and, and, and I think just from, this wasn't my case but um, what I've picked up is that this man felt he had a story to tell and that perhaps he, he, he wanted to get that across so his interest was in perhaps um, convincing the audience that, you know, well, actually, I am right, and I'm going to show these social workers up for what they are. So, you know, people make their own mind up. And, uh... and a lot of the time you've got people are protecting other people, so the guardian's there to, to, to represent the child, yeah. and the, social, the child social worker is representing the child as well. But who's standing up for him? Um, the social worker, um, you know, we, we, do, we complete assessments. Um, we are happy to assess parents as, you know, good or good enough or, and, and put in support and to enable. You know, there are those cases like this where whatever you do, 
um, parents are just not going to be able to parent. Um, and so that, you know, that, that this is one of those cases. But you know, a good outcome for us is when we are able to keep families together. Um, I think the editing in that is the other thing that mm. is, is extraordinary. I mean, it's beautifully, beautifully shot, but also beautifully cut. How long did you spend crafting those kinds of scenes? That was Colette Hodges who cut that. And um, yeah, she's amazing. She's a brilliant editor. And yeah, we very quickly picked up on that, that it was all about... There's something very haunting about all these toy noises going on. There's something quite dark and, you know, that, and this inability and this desperation from the child's point of view to connect with his parents. For those who haven't seen the film, he, that, that, that's a, a called a contact session. So the, the child has been removed from the parents' care and this is the first time that his, the, the, the dad has seen his own child since he's been removed. And for, for normal, well-adjusted parents, that's obviously a kind of a, immensely emotional... And, I, and I'm sure, knowing Mike, that he felt that, but he's got an inability to be able to express that. And so he, you know, he's on the phone when he walks in and what, what message does that give to his own child? And then when the child is picking up the toy phone to communicate with his dad, and kind of go, mm, you know, he can't quite do that. And then he's playing with the toys at the end instead of you know, saying goodbye properly to his child. It's deeply, I, I share Petra's point of view, it's deeply <coughs> upsetting, but it's also, and, and you've also got the perspective of the Guardian assessing, and I, there's that single shot where he just does the faintest of shakes of his head, and you kind of know in that moment that it's curtains for, for him as a dad. And, and <laughs> it's, yeah, it's very poignant, and I think it's what good observational telly can do well, which is, it's kind of, can nuance and can kind of suggest all sorts of stuff without having to, you know, in a single look or in, a, in an inability to connect that, that you, as an audience, you can get loads from that. And I think that's, that's where telly is really, really strong. And it's less strong when you kind of are trying to tell the audience loads and loads and loads of facts that they need to take on board and all of that is, is, is more cumbersome. But that in, in, the, in those spaces there, I think there's, there's that's great to be able to do that. Yeah. I think what's fabulous, as you will have gathered, I'm quite a fan of this series, but I think what's, <laughs> what's fantastic about, and that, that scene typifies it, is that there is that space given, that you know, the, there isn't that sort of need that seems to be around a lot these days on television, of, you know, keep it going, keep it going, keep it moving, keep it moving, on to the next scene, on to the next thing, and, and uh, it's just beautifully paced out and allows us just to enter that world and get in there. In terms of, of um, you know, I was saying who's, who's looking out for Mike, the dad, I mean, you've got a responsibility to your contributors. You've got a responsibility to him, a duty of care to him. How do you assess? Yeah, on the one hand, yeah, you, you're saying some people say, well, well they, they wouldn't be able to just consent, so, so you're not even going to talk to them. But at the same time, you've got a duty to assess mm -hmm. whether it's in his best interest. How do you do that? How, how's... Is that, is that a it's really process? difficult. It's interesting. I mean, we land up kind of working. I, I've thought about this, and I think there's kind of three different levels <coughs> on which we have some kind of responsibility. We've got a legal responsibility, which we kind of talked about already. You know, is Mike was he able to give informed consent? You know, was he mentally sound enough? Was he did he understand the processes? And we talked to our solicitors and we talked to his own solicitors and him about that and everyone was in agreement that, that, that he was fine for that. Then there's a kind of the programme's responsibilities, if you like, in terms of Ed Pohl, in terms of, uh, you know, and then there's also your own individual, is a human, and you've kind of got three, an individual moral thing, a programme thing and a legal thing, and they're all, they don't necessarily always overlap. They, they, they should, more often than not, they do. But every now and then you would have situations where, you know, you felt we could do this story. You know, we, we, there's no reason we can't cover this, but it didn't feel right and it didn't feel good. With Mike, it's an interesting one where he started out as a, in a position of feeling very strongly that he wanted, he was the person I referred to when I'm saying that he wanted a record of what was going on because he felt it was so there was a huge injustice going on and that, that social services were picking on him and it would be great that there's a, there's a record of this. And over the course of, as, as things developed and changed massively, he probably, you know, 
he didn't state this ever directly, but I'm sure he probably lent up altering his opinion on that. But we gave him lots and lots of opportunities not to continue. And he disappeared for a while, and it was all, you know, but he always remained in contact with us, and he's still in contact today. You know, he, we, we, we're in regular contact with him. And, yeah, it's difficult. It's complicated. I, I, I don't think there are simple, straightforward answers about whether it's right or not. You've got to go with, you know, it's, this is a relationship that you, we had for well over a year, very closely with him. And you listen to what he says, and you think, okay, and you make those, those assessments on an individual level, anyway, you've got to, you know, clarify the other two that legal and Edpol are happy with it. And then, you know, for yourself, you've got to determine, do, do I feel that this is okay? <coughs> and I think I do, you know. But it, it's not straightforward. It really isn't straightforward. And at different points in the relationship, you might think different things. And Tiffany, who's the, the partner, it's interesting, her consent situation was almost the direct opposite of that, where she wasn't that sure to begin with whether she wanted to take part, did agree, but was kind of, you could see that Mike was leading that more. And then by the end, she managed to turn <coughs> around the situation where she used the film as a way of passing a message on to her children. She gave up her children to be adopted, willingly in the end, and used the film as a way of sending a message to her children in the future. And so her whole process of consent completely altered, and it landed up being a very empowering and positive thing for her. But we never could have imagined that, you know, to 10 months before. So it evolves, it's a kind of, it's, 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 it's massively complicated. Yeah. Can I so, add something sorry. quickly? Um, just to say the theme of the programme, this, this episode was about babies being taken away, but um, the, that those are the minority of cases. So, you know, most of the time, in the vast majority of cases, social workers support families, and, you know, our job is to keep mm. families together, and that is what usually happens. So just to clarify that. Thanks. Good <laughs> question over there. Thanks. And it was in, they were sort of in response to the Lord Laming report um, about baby P in Victoria Columbia. And so one of the things we were looking at was how services work together. Mm -hmm. And I know it's not in the film and I can completely understand how you would have made that choice not to put it in. But did it affect your access and your relationship with them, particularly in a case like that family? Because I imagine that mental health services might have been involved and other people having a stake in their story. Mm -hmm. And I know from experience that they don't often get on or they might not get on. And I don't know what it's like in Bristol, but in some places in London, that would have made it very difficult. So how was it for you? Yeah, multi-agency work between the different kind of support groups is huge. It's a massive, massive... And I would say in Bristol, it's pretty good in the main, not exclusively, but it's pretty good. So for that family, there was a family support worker who was really involved with the case, who, didn't, who was kind of happy that we filmed but didn't want to be included herself. And so that did change the story to a degree and the way in which we could shape and tell that story because she would have been included and without a doubt if, if she had been willing to consent, but she didn't. And, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, one of the clips we're, we're going to show later on is about a big multi-agency meeting that deals exactly with this. We'll so, we'll so yeah. yeah. But it's a, yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> it's really not easy. Do, if you, I, there's bright lights in my eyes, but if you've got questions, just stick your hand up and wave. And Oh, there we go. Chris. Just in relation to, to Michael, the character in that, <clears throat> were they involved in the fence and accuracy screening? or when you Were they involved in, in, a, in a protocol screening at the end? Did they see the film before it went out? So everyone was invited to see the film, and everyone, in fact, Mike was the only one in the end who didn't see the film, and we must have tried 20 times plus to get him. We really wanted him, him more than most, we really wanted to, him to see it because it's, um, we had concerns for him and for his welfare after around broadcasts. And so we tried and tried and tried, and, and Tiffany did watch the film, and for her it was immensely emotional and difficult viewing and she was in floods of tears afterwards but she also saw herself it's very interesting in that viewing she just was 
that the, the condition of the flat that they were living in was quite poor at the beginning. And she was just so taken aback and shocked by how it was. And she's just, my goodness, what were we doing? And she had a moment of real self-reflection. For Mike, it was really important for us, to, for him to watch it. We never succeeded in doing that. But he has watched it and is fine with it since. Um, but it, that's a grave cause of concern for us. And it was one of the big things leading up to transmission about, well, Mm, everyone's seen it apart from him, and it was he's. I don't. I don't quite know why he didn't. Yeah, but he got in touch. He got in touch. Oh yeah, this time, and it exactly. was arranged, and he didn't show up. Yeah, we so had these. Like yeah, him. exactly. We we had viewing after viewing set up at the BBC, mm -hmm. and then twenty minutes before he'd say, oh, "I'm sorry, I can't come," and say, so "Oh, that's fine." But this went on and on and on and on to the point where we were like, Look, "Okay, I'm, you know, realistically, this has got. We've done this a dozen times." This is the last opportunity to see the film. Please, please come. And then he didn't show, and you know, and we still continued talking to him after about it. But so, but we'd have been a lot happier if he did, and everyone else did, and it was really important. And we had a whole se in the in the editing process, we kind of down tools uh, with about a week of cutting to go, and showed everyone. And that's kind of a big process. That's kind of all the individual social workers, their bosses, the heads of the council the legal team, our legal team, Medpol, all the families concerned, each in separate <coughs> viewings. And so it was weeks and weeks of viewings, so our co-producers and, and all of them, of course, have their comments. And so then we've got to, you know, react to all of those. And, and it took you, eight, you say you were filming for 18 months. How long were you editing for? Um, what was it, about four or five months, probably? Very intensive. The edit was very intensive. Yeah. But, yeah. So there was another question. So, uh, yeah. Oh. Uh, sorry. No, you had your hand up first. Well, there we are. If you pass, just hang on. Wait for the mic. <coughs> and then if you pass it over to here. Can you? Oh yeah. Pet, can I turn Petra's mic up? Actually, we can't hear you very well. And um, I just wanted to ask what it was filmed on. What you shot it on. Um, the 350. <laughs> it's. Uh, it was. It's the newest, it was the, what was it, it was after the DSR was the uh, um, clip, um, tapeless camera. <coughs> so it was so like, it was a, like, like, it's like a larger EX3 essentially. Well, it had a, no, it's like a DSR. It's but it had a, proper lenses on and it was, uh, we had it with a, what's it called, nano flash nano thing flash. and you could put cards into it and so we'd, which is great, actually, because then you can record straight for several hours. I can't remember what three it was, hours. but three hours ago without having to... And changing cards is just... So you don't have that whole tape in, labelling up and so you know, that's That side of it and is lovely. And you went straight into the habit and the So we're just going to take two more questions, and then we're going to see the next clip. Um, yeah. Vanessa Engel, um, I've got two questions, actually. One is... Three more questions, then. Um, <laughs> one is... It sounds an incredibly complicated thing that you navigated, <coughs> Sasha, and, and the films you made before were very unlikely. So I just, so my first question is, how did you know how to navigate this incredibly complicated landscape? And my second question is, um, did any of the, I felt worried about some of the contributors, mm -hmm. did any of them have bad experiences, you know, when they next went to Asda or, mm -hmm. you know, walked down <coughs> the street? Because I can imagine that some of them might have, mm suffered abuse? Uh, first question is, I learned along the way. I really, really, really did not know. I thought I knew, but I didn't know um, at the beginning. And it was, a, it was good that it was that long. So, you know, when I read the protocol, I thought, oh, yeah, I've got my hands around that. I completely didn't get what it was about. Somebody said to me, oh, it's quite important you get the Guardians on side early on. I didn't even know what Guardian was, and I was like, okay, well, okay, that's quite important. And then as time progressed, oh, well, you learn as you go. And in a sense, um, it's the, one of those kind of projects which you just land up living completely and get, you know, and then you become obsessive about it, <laughs> as we all are. And just, and so, yeah, just learn doing it, really. Um, in terms of the... Yeah, it was a huge... I think that was our biggest worry in terms of... There are two or three characters in the, in the series I just thought, what's going to happen to you after transmission? And we talked at length with all of them beforehand. But you kind of... Re re you reach a point where you've got sort of control about the situation, and then it goes into the public realm, and you just lose every sense of... And 
you know, thoughts of tabloid press, people knocking on, on contributors' doors, or, you know, some of our contributors getting in difficult situations and it all kicking off, and then, you know, just, just nightmares and nightmares. We, we were quite lucky in the sense of a lot of the most vulnerable people at the time, A, weren't in Bristol, for one reason or another, they landed up being in different parts of the country. A lot of them were in safe houses or institutions where they were kind of being looked after anyway, so we had kind of, we knew that, or had very close support around them where we could safely say that person's looking out for them around transmission. And, and can I just ask Ben, did, did social services have any support in place for the, the, the people in, in the series? Um, in terms of, yeah, and the, and I guess, I don't know if there's any specific um, put in place beyond sort of, the, you know, the social worker there and, and, you know, they're in it together, but um, no, not as far as I'm aware. What about the social workers? Did they get any uh, counselling? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, we, we, but um, I think all those social workers are rather happy to be involved with it, and, and it's been an entirely positive thing, thankfully, so we haven't needed counselling. <laughs> We've but got a question at the back. A lot of social workers didn't want to take part because they worked on patch, and so the idea then of them being in the supermarket, having been on TV, and you're that person, and they've got to live there and work there, and that's completely understandable. Question at the back. I thought it was a fantastic series, so congratulations. Um, just talking about showing the film to the countless people, did you have a situation whereby someone said, actually, I don't want this to be shown, and therefore did it make a whole sequence or possibly a full story to fall through, and what did you do? It's always quite strange when you show films to contributors because you land up, as a, as a programme maker, there's always, there's always little bits in the film, I find, where you're just going... Are they going to, what are they, they're going to react to that, aren't they? And of course, it's never those bits. It's just, I don't know why that is, and I've never understood why that is. But it, so, so a couple of people did have small requests, but they were just things where we could just go, you know what, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, we can do that. And, and it didn't change our overall story in any way. I guess where it gets more difficult is when you've got um, different sets of people saying slightly conflicting things about the message of the film or saying that, that structurally should it be like this or should it be like that and if you've got too many chefs in that respect it's never a good thing but <laughs> okay so the clips we've seen so far have both been from programs one and three and what we're going to do we're going to try we're running a bit behind but if we can rattle through we'll try and show you um a few clips now which are all, all in sequence from program two which sort of tell the story of program two Sasha, do you want to very briefly set up the, the scene we're about to see where you arrive at the door? So this is a, this is a scene about a couple called Sean and Marva. Um, social workers could only visit them with security, and he had a history of violence, and it's quite an interesting character to deal with. And it landed up being a very strange situation where we could only go and film with the social worker whilst they went with, with um, security vests on, and we never kind of knew what we would get. It's a very atypical kind of situation. We'd, you know, ideally, well, it varied, but so they, they, these were almost always unannounced visits, and we wouldn't know what we'd get. We wouldn't know whether they'd be there, whether what state they would be in, and what we're about to see is uh, a visit where they're in a highly agitated state. Okay, can we <coughs> run the next piece? Can we have the volume slightly higher? Hi, Sean. Are you all right for me to do a quick visit? Not a good time. Not a good time? Come in. Can I? Is that all right? Crazy state, all right, yeah? How many are you, yeah? I've got the BBC here with me. Oh, the crew, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> you right to yeah. catch me on a real good day. Uh, where's the dog? No, I've got a dog. Oh, the I dog's gone? Oh. How are you doing, Marva? Right. What happened with the police then? The drink. She's been drinking a lot of cider. Yeah. She needs help. That's the truth, sweetheart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't care. And by the way, right, yeah, I got a word with you. Can I discuss something with you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're actually taking my kids away from me. Yeah? That's what Mama told me. Well, it's about how you would provide for your children. I would not harm my fucking kids. All right, yeah. I would never harm my kids. I don't care what anybody says, all right, yeah? At the end of the day, I stick up for my brother. I love her. I look after her, okay? 
And this is what it brings me. She brings me to drink, right, yeah? But I do love her, OK? And I care about her. But you know what? I just want to leave her. And that's the truth. And she's six months pregnant with my child, right, yeah? I'll be honest with you, right, yeah? Six months pregnant, right, yeah? And I don't know if I can go for it again, man. You know what Yeah, but, like, because I, I... Listen, right, yeah? Because I've had abuse in life. Don't mean, like... I'm going to do it to my children, because I've never hurt my children, right, yeah? I'm a man, right, yeah? I want to buy my kids quad bikes. I want to buy my kids a scrambler, you know? Man, I'll be honest with you, right, yeah? I can't even work, because I'm so fucked up in the head, right, yeah? I have give up drink for a couple of months, right, yeah? Now I'm binge drinking. It's nothing to be proud about, right, yeah? It's just to wash my feelings away. But when you wake up the next morning, it's still there. It's still there, man. So, Sasha, when you arrive, he's obviously very drunk. Um, mm. He can't give informed consent, can he? No, absolutely not. But that's not the whole process. So if we had to uh, say there and then, then, of course, we, we wouldn't have been able to film. But it's a long process in which he would have seen, and he did see, the film. And it's, a, it's an interesting and difficult situation, that, because we turned up and... Yeah, he, he, I don't know if this is true or not, but he said he'd been up for three nights straight at that point. And he certainly had, and when we went into the flat, it was just whew, a, lot of, a lot of drink all around. And they were like, no, you can't film in here now. And that was totally fine. And so we were waited. And then Sean came out and said, right, I want to film the garden. Let's go now. I've got some stuff to say to you. And I, I kind of come from the school where you just, all right, if you can film, then film. You know, if people are saying film, then film. And make those difficult decisions later because there's always time to decide this isn't appropriate to show or this isn't right, but there's never time to film again. You know, if you, if you don't film that. And he's asking to film, you know. And who am I to say that he shouldn't ultimately? Now, of course, he said later on, God, I don't know what I said to you. What, what was that all about? You know, I, I, he didn't know what... So of course, we don't have informed consent at that point in the process. We can't possibly have informed consent. And he was worried about that scene. He, he, he's, you know... He's, but when he saw it, he was totally fine with it. He was absolutely fine with it. And in fact, we showed it to him twice to just make sure he was completely good with it. And, you know, it represents his true feelings about what he thinks about his childhood and his children. And, um, you know, we do a sober interview with him at another point in the film, and they're kind of, you know, they, 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 they stack up together. I would feel nervous if I felt we were representing him in a way which wasn't true, if he was bullshitting us when we were drunk and when we kind of thought, oh, that would be good to include. Well, I'm not so keen on that, but I didn't feel that. So... Yeah. And I think that's another example there when he comes out and she says that I'm with the BBC and that kind of thing where you're, you're kind of smashing through the fourth wall one day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how did you, you obviously chose to include that. Was that something that you made a conscious decision about the, the, the presence of yeah. the impact? You, it's one of those things where the act of observation changes that which is observed, isn't it? Yeah, very much. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't think that... It's what happened, you know, and I think that we, it's, it's interesting material, very, it reveals part of the story, it reveals what's going on in their relationship, and yes, he said it to me rather than to Annie, which we'd have preferred ideally, but that's how it happened, and I feel that, well, you know, so we landed up hard-cutting straight from that into Annie being there. So it's very clear, it's very obvious that he's speaking to us as a crew, and then he's speaking to Annie in a conversation, and... I don't mind that. I just think that, you know, and I think we've cut it deliberately in a way, you know, all of those jump cuts, which is very clear. We're being very straight and honest about, you know, we're, it's, it's obvious. We're not, there's no artifice about what we're doing, hopefully. So I don't have a problem with it. No, I think, I think rules are made to be broken. And you're very much um, by turning up with the, the, the security people and so on and so forth. You, you, you're very much... There's no pretense of sort of being even-handed about it. You're very much in the camp of the, of the social workers, in a way, aren't you? I would feel, across the story, we weren't. I mean, it's difficult in that scenario because the, it's the only way we could go and visit him. So, 
Yeah, I can see what you mean in the way that we turn up with the with security, with the social worker, and so we're kind of aligned on that side of the... But there's other points in the story where we go and see when it's clear that the security risk, we're not all going to get eaten alive if we go and see him on our own, that we, we talk to him on our own, and, and he, we have an in-depth interview with him, which is clearly aligned on his side. So, you know, the, as, as I said earlier, I very much hope we, we tell both sides, both stories, hopefully reasonably sympathetically, that we get the social worker's perspective, but also the, the families, and it's important. But it, it was just a practical, that's the only way we could film that scene. There's, it, actually, you just made me think of this. There's a scene in, in the previous um, BBC Bristol series with a social worker, Someone's Watch Over Me, where a social worker is arriving, mm -hmm. and before the social worker arrives, the mother is mm -hmm. in the other room smoking from a crack pipe, and then, and saying, oh, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone, and kind of wafting it out the window, that kind of thing. And then she goes back in, and then the social worker arrives, and they have a discussion, and she sits there and says to the social worker that she's clean. <laughs> That's... Yeah. What, the ethics of that are a bit complex, aren't they? Yeah. Really complicated. Really. <laughs> and it caused a big stir that I remember actually approaching social workers this time around. That scene, oh, there was... That, social workers were a lot were up in arms about that, saying that we... You know, it's kind of putting the knife into the social worker. It appeared in the way that it was cut in the program, and we actually did some investigation to try and find out what had happened. And I think what happened, if it, I have said a while since I've seen this, but I think that the the mum goes off into another room and drinks vodka and smokes while the while the social worker's in the flat and smokes heroin or crack. I can't remember what it is. And 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 then comes back in, and the, and the camera is kind of witnessing this all. So you witness the social worker filling in forms and trying to help this mum, but you also witness in a room her, obviously, at a point where she's not in control, and she's probably not in a fit state to look after her children. And, but it is weird, because you... <coughs> as we, <coughs> excuse me, go on. We land up kind of occupying this quite peculiar and kind of privileged position where we are between the families and the social workers, and get to hear both sides, you know, what they both say about each other. And that's totally artificial. That doesn't happen in life. You know, we hear, so the families will tell us, oh, God, I hate that, so, well, whatever. And we would hear from the social worker's point of view, well, I can tell you that child's going to be removed in six months, come what may. And we're privileged, and we, of course, we wouldn't land up telling either side about that. It's a totally false position. It doesn't happen in life. It, it can't happen in life. And it's a weird... It's a weird space to operate in because you kind of, you, you're semi-omniscient, you kind of know more than you should in a work sense. And that's, that's, a, that's a delicate balance of how to deal with that knowledge. Were there concerns in the team on, on social work side that there might be occasions where Sasha or the members of the team were witnessing something or hearing something or being told something that might affect the welfare of a child and would then that would then put them in a difficult position because did they betray the confidence of mm. the contributor or did they tell you? you I know? think the, the confidence goes up to a certain point. Obviously, there's a child protection concern and, and that mm. has to be raised. Yeah, but they're not professionals. No, no, no but, we, but, 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 but we've made it very clear to all the families we worked with that w everything they would say to us would be in confidence as long as it wasn't affecting the welfare of their child. And so in that scenario... But my, we but would my have point is, <coughs> you're not a professional... In a qualified to no, what we would have landed what, up what uh, actually does affect the, the welfare of the child. I think we would have landed up in that situation. I think we would have landed up saying to the family, "I think you should tell your social worker that that's happened. I think you should do that because if you don't do that, we we would feel the need to be able to do that." But we were very clear with all of our families from the outset that we would remain in total confidence unless it affected that. And if they, so, if they landed up. You know, we saw a family whacking their child or something. Well, of course, we, we, we then, we're witness to something which we need to pass on to the social workers. And it's the same responsibility as any member of the public yeah. or yeah. the is professional that, in, is that, has in, in that situation. So the next scene is, is Marva's case conference. Just to update us, Sasha, mm. on, on what's, what's happened in the story. So Sean and Marva have split up at this point, and Marva has gone 
um, to live with a foster carer and is making remarkable progress. And this is what's called a case conference where they determine what status um, her future child is going to be. So is it going to be on a child protection register? Is it going to be, which in this case it automatically would be because of her, she'd had children removed in the past and was at high risk. But they're also determining whether she's going to get a chance to actually have a chance of parenting her child. This is, this is the situation we were talking about in terms of the multi-agency group. And so around this table, there's probably 15, maybe more people. And it's a kind of three or four hour meeting. Again, heavy handheld for long, long periods of time. But what we, do, what we did great is in terms of trying to, it's fine if people don't want to take part. And we would just have a quick chat before and we'd let everyone know that we were coming to film. And probably over half of the people there didn't want to be filmed. So we've got members of the police there who didn't want to be filmed, there's members of different charities there who'd worked with Marva who didn't want to be filmed. But the great skill of Petra and our editors is kind of, it feels as if we're just intimate in here and that what we witness is the meeting. And of course it isn't. But Yeah, this is one of those wonderful things, I agree, where, where you just don't notice what you're not seeing. Can we run the next clip? The baby could be born any day now. A case conference will determine its future. Annie advises that the newborn be placed on a child protection plan, the highest category of risk. This conference is really to draw up a plan to ensure that when the baby is born, that it will be looked after kept properly and try and assess if you're going to be that person who looks after the baby. Marva is consistently saying that she understands that going back to Sean would increase mm -hmm. the risk factors of alcohol use and domestic violence and you know, has done absolutely everything that could have been asked of her. So Marva, can I ask you just one or two questions about the pregnancy? What is different this time? It's what, what? Just kind of going through giving birth to another baby and giving it away. Well, yeah. obviously I didn't give them away, but... Like... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you really want this one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I want to hear a little bit more about Sean now. He did take an overdose last Friday and was in the BRI over the weekend. <clears throat> but I've seen him twice since then he agrees that actually the two of you are not helpful for each other and when you're together things are not good. Martha, we've heard consistently how people are saying that the two of you together, it doesn't work. No. And, and you've taken the decision that you can make it on your own. Having heard what Andy said, does that change anything for you or do you feel, <coughs> still feel the same way? No, I still feel the same way, but it is upsetting. Yes, of course. OK, do you want a tissue? No, OK. And it's usually very good with tissues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do carry a stock with me yeah. at all times. <laughs> OK. So I'm kind of, tr having focused on how you covered that, I'm now confused about the geography of the room because you seem to start at one end and I would assume you'd put all the people who didn't want to be filmed at that end yeah but then halfway through you're at the other end of the room so what happened I can't remember the, <laughs> the only thing is uh, I do usually what I do is um, obviously put all the people who don't want to be filmed on one side so I can shoot over shoulder use them as dirty foreground as I call it and, um, but also I'm not afraid to cross the line. So I did cross the line a few times. Um, and I hope most people know what it means. And, uh, and also I do move quite a lot. There is the opposite, I move a lot, but I also make sure when I come into the room, if I have somehow, uh, if it's possible to sit, you know, Marv or somebody you feel more in, a, in uh, Different, I look at the room, look where the lighting is, natural lighting, obviously, and try, if I can, to control it a bit where they're sitting. Obviously not telling them, can you sit here, but so kind of guiding them in. And, um, yeah, and move a lot. I do move a lot, but 
and make sure you can move around, that there's enough space. So, across the line. <laughs> so, does everyone, everyone understand across the line? Anyone not understand across the line? I'll put it that way. <laughs> no, sure. good, no one puts their hand up, because we all know what we're talking about. Um, so, oh, sorry. So Does, and I would guess. Oh, I've got a loud voice. <laughs> they want it. They want it for the record. Oh, okay, sorry. I would guess that the when Marva does this with her hands, that's quite a telling. Mm. You know, you knowing, and those are the things that Petra will be looking for, and that you can really guarantee that Petra is going to get. Mm. So the little boy with the bag. The really telling thing I would, you know, from that scene is that he wants the bag. He starts putting the bag on because he really mm. wants to go. Mm. Mm. So mm. Petra will go into a scene, and obviously, having spoken to you, but you, you will see emotionally what's really important in that scene. And so that's what I think is the important thing about her filming. It's so true. The editor. I remember the editor's response when they when he saw that for the first time, Ollie, and he he was just like, wow, the intimacy in that room. And it's a big, white-walled, open plant, mm. horrible room with a big table in the middle. But you feel, f from the way it's shot, mm. you're so with Marva. And when she... It's, it's difficult, we saw, saw an abbreviated thing there, but when she, she cries in that scene, and, mm. and it's a pivotal moment in mm. the film, and it's her feeling, uh, expressing her love for Sean, but knowing that she has to be in another place. And... and yeah, so many people would not have got that in the way that it was... It no, was, exactly, yeah. and that's... So I think, I kind of think that those emotional things is... So Petra might be, mi like, missing lots of things, and, but, but the one thing she'll be looking for is the, this sort of emotional, mm. as you say, mm. the sort of pivot kind of point, the, the bag going on, or, mm. or those looks from Marva, which you clearly... Then you really know what, something about her without saying anything. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, the, and the, when, when Marva first comes in and there's the woman in the foreground who, who sort of unhelpfully leans into shot, <laughs> you, you sort of re reframe. Mm. Do, when she's blurred, do you have to sort of show her the blur and say, is that all right? Is, are you blurred enough? No, that? we had a great... In that particular instance, we didn't. <clears throat> With other issues like the child Toby where we've blurred him throughout the film, that was a big issue about the level of blurring and from my point of view I wanted to be able to see a face and still have a, you know, but, and have some understanding of the expressions and he's a person, he's not just a blobby shape, you know. But then obviously there's a point where that becomes, he's clearly identifiable and we need, so that level of, that was a lot of issues about, you know, and there's a lot of, and it's fine, fine parameters. And you who are those discussions with? Legal team. So his, the child solicitor and our legal team at that point. And from the other thing about that meeting is, Ben, that's obviously, you know, you, I can't remember where you said it was two hours or something like that. Is that what you said? It was anyway, it was a long, so long it was a long meeting, mm. lots of people involved. Mm. Did, did, were there concerns about how represented, you know, you cut that down to three minutes mm. or whatever, were there concerns about how represented, because these are huge, huge decisions that are being made that are actually being made very carefully and very yeah, slowly. Yeah, a lot of consideration. And yet it's sort of yeah. three minutes, bang, it's gone. I mean, I think that's thing, you know, with the whole series, because you can't show mm. every stage of these processes because, you know, quite often, you know, you work with a family over a year and, and you know, it's a gradual process and each stage is painfully discussed and, and, and you know, support's put in place and there's other different agencies involved and just to... Um, to, it's impossible to convey the whole um, process in, in a programme an hour long. Um, so I think, you know, for the team, it must have been just about trying to pick out the key points and, and give as good an impression as possible. That, but, you know, yeah, I think one of the things um, from social workers that came out of the programme was that, was that like, oh, it doesn't really show the, the sort of care and mm. time and attention we put into trying to keep families together and support them and so on. Um, but it, it's an impossible task to do that in an hour. 
Mm. I mean, so there are lots. Of, we need a longer. One. <laughs> it's interesting because there, there were comments about what you know. I think it's what is it? Seventy percent, eighty percent of your time you spent sat at a computer yeah. and putting data. So every phone call, everything is recorded and has to be recorded. But of course, from storytelling point of view, that's dull as this mm. And But but that people have said, well, you're not showing that side of the job, and you know. But ultimately, we're telling a story. Mm. We, we, it's, it's so. Yeah, I mean, the, the social work world has been pretty positive, hasn't it, on the whole? Um, Any brickbats come your way? Uh, I think I, someone emailed saying that you, I didn't strap the child properly in the car when they took it away. <laughs> um, but, but I think that's about it. I, I've, been, I've been absolutely um, bowled over by how positive the reactions have been to the programmes. And, you know, it's... I remember emailing Sasha and, you know, in the midst of all this great positive feedback from, mem you know, random members of the public to the directors of social services to our own colleagues and family and friends. It was so almost universally well-received, you know. And, and I emailed Sasha saying it actually just feels like a bit of a game-changer. And I think the orthodoxy before was, um, you know, ineffective, um, inefficient, do good in social workers, don't get anything right. And now the orthodoxy is fair play. I couldn't do what you do. I don't know how you do that. You know, so that I think that's been, you know, the programme has really um, been key in, in that kind of change in attitude. So I think, you know, from our point of view, from a social work point of view, it's, it's been great. It's been a really positive thing. So, Sasha, can you just take, take, set us up again, sort of praising the next few minutes of the film, <laughs> getting to the point where we were of Marvel's wobble? Um, this, this, this was my birthday. This was a lovely day. Oh, good. I won't forget this day for a long, long time. Um, so, we have been working with Marva now for probably eight, nine months, and she had just made the most remarkable incredible progress and kind of defied everyone's expectations and and before this case happened it, that she had had previous cases where where she was barely able to speak to social workers everything had to go through Sean and he she, she's you know she's she's got a, she's very very vulnerable and she was just making such and we were all so on side for her and then one morning this news came in that she had gone missing and it was, we were all just so devastated because we're very much a part of this story and still are in some respects. And, and, um, and so this is the scene about what happened that day. <laughs> that was the GV. That's the GV. <laughs> For five weeks, Marva sticks to the agreement and the boy thrives in her care it doesn't last. Hello. She's just saying, hey, is she? I'm going to get away, come up then. Yesterday, Marva disappeared with her son. Yeah, After 14 hours, she was found drunk at Sean's. The police brought them back at three in the morning. Elaine stayed up the rest of the night feeding the baby. Starving. Mm. He's, 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 you know, he's happy and content, but I haven't seen her since. A uh, bit of a surprise. Well, yes. <laughs> Goodness me. Mm. I'm scared, scared of what the next steps are, what will happen next, anyway. For Martha? Yeah. Yeah, it's not looking that good at the minute. And I understand your position and I don't see where you can come back from. There's always going to be that temptation, just for the mm. fact that we were in Kingswood and bumped into his dad. Excuse me. Just Hi, Martha. She's phoning me. Put this walk. No, okay. I'll get a knock. My first blip? It is your first blip. What is really difficult is that your first blip has serious consequences. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the partnership agreement? Yeah. We're going to have to separate you and baby. Because basically we were hoping that we could trust you mm -hmm. 
to be able to keep him safe. And the two really big risk factors were you drinking and you going and seeing Sean. Yeah. And that's what we've done. As a, basically, I've been through with my mother what the consequences of her going to see Sean were and drinking, which is that she has to leave and that we will be finding alternative accommodation for, in the near future, really. Um, I was going to be all right, but I'm not. <laughs> she really regrets what happened. And she doesn't know where she's going to go, and I'm not able to give her very much reassurance, really. What does Martha want? Martha wants another opportunity to stay with her. Um, I think she understands that that she's messed up big time and that the risk of her seeing Sean and of her having a drink was that they would be separated. And she wants to do contact and, and to, to be assessed. Can you come and join us? I've had a chat with Arthur and sadly he agrees with me that you need to leave today. So I've explained to Elaine I'll go back to the office and get that form, this form faxed off to him, wherever my form is. What I need to explain to you as well, and we probably ought to write it down as a new partnership agreement, is that Elaine is now the primary carer for... that while you're here, it's fine for you to be caring for him. But we'd ask that you don't take him out. Yeah. If you did take him out anywhere, I'd have to get Elaine to call the police straight away. Um, and what we're trying to do is work together and avoid sort of emergency rushing off to court and police coming round and taking out police powers of protection and things. So it's about us trying to work together. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just saying that this is to clarify new plans for his care following a breach of the original partnership agreement. Marla's agreed the baby will be looked after by Elaine until an alternative foster placement is identified for him. Marva will leave. Is that okay? Do you want to have a look through it before you sign it? solicitor and I'll be in touch. Do phone me if you want and I'll be in touch. Not today. I don't think anyway. <coughs> So, Sasha, as a director, you've got a choice then. Do you stay with Marvel or do you follow Annie? 
Um, well, Pets are beautifully in the moment stayed with Marva. I love that last shot. Mm -hmm. I love that last shot of her on her own without the professional support with her baby as she's for the last few hours. Um, what we practically landed doing is uh, we went off with Annie in the end. We said goodbye to Marva there and then. Went and talked to Annie in the car, and that's the next bit in the film for those who've seen it. Is uh, her talking about how difficult that was, and she burst into tears about how that was the hardest thing she had to do as a social worker, and she's desperately trying to hold it together and be professional in that moment. But it was, um, you know, going back to that kind of legal, editorial, personal thing that we talked about earlier on. Personally, for, for both, for all of us, it was just immensely, it was a heartbreaking day, and we landed up, it's just the, the vagaries of the system, the way it worked is that because Marva wasn't, um, wasn't then eligible to be the parent, she then had to leave that home, and she was basically out on the street. She, she, wasn't, she wasn't qualified for adult social support at that point, and so the system had just gone, there you go, you know, you're out, get on with it. And from our point of view, that was just unacceptable. You know, we all felt that, um, well, we all felt initially that shouldn't she be given another chance? And I'm not sure I held that view now, but at the time it was just very, very difficult to accept. And then, so we landed up being back in touch with her later and helping her find accommodation that night and making sure she was safe and okay because she couldn't, she wasn't in a position she could do that stuff on her own and it was difficult, it was a really hard day. What do you think about Petra? Oh, very much so. I mean, it was, I think in the project, one of the hardest days apart from with Addy, that was, uh, I remember driving down the M4 and I had you know, just going to work and then I got this phone call that um, mom was so shown and I was just like, oh, I can't believe it, can't believe it. And I was really upset, not knowing, well, knowing, kind of knowing what's going to happen, but hoping obviously not then. It was difficult. Uh, can I, I just, still can't hardly yeah. watch it. But it's I mean, really, it's what happened scene. in that room is pretty amazing because it's actually oh, yeah. during the course of that scene, mm -hmm. The way that that scene unfolded is really remarkable. So, understandably, Martha had just, she phoned Annie, she didn't know Annie was in the house. So she phoned Annie, she had just woken up, she phoned Annie and said, look, I need to speak to you. And of course, Annie's right in the house already and goes to see, and, and we go with her, but she says, look, just hold on, I've just woken up, give me a moment, and, and kind of didn't want to film, and obviously, understandable, <laughs> we were, we didn't push it, surprise, surprise. Uh, uh, but then what happened is I found amazing and I think, for, for, and I think that it's, it's a kind of good example of why long-term projects, why they're valuable and why if you'd been filming for two weeks with Marva, there's no way that she would have decided, okay, let's, you know, she's fully aware that we're filming in the front room and she's had time to assess it and she's thinking about it and she comes in of her own accord and just walks in as we're in the middle of filming and sits down and wants to take part in the scene. And that's, a, that's, that's an amalgamation of our relationship. That's, that's her wanting to take part. And for her, that's amazing. That's very, very, it's, it's difficult to explain how she's a very internal character and to, on that day to want to participate in what we were doing in that way was amazing. And it was unspoken and she did it on her own accord. And, and uh, yes, yeah, difficult. It meant a huge amount actually for us. And to transform the scene as well because it's, you can see on her face what it means. And so Ben, Sasha says, the team were feeling Marma should have been given another chance. Mm. Should have been given another chance? Um, I must say it's not my case and I don't know all the lead up to it, but I mean, there, there comes a point where people do run out of chances because you give every effort for people to give the right, do the right thing, put in the right support and, and, and uh, encourage them and so on. But you can't do that forever and, and clearly there was a risk to that baby taking them away and to Sean and drinking and so on. So um, the, the, the social workers in that case made that decision. I've no reason to think that wasn't the right decision. By the way, I don't think this anymore now. 
Yeah. I thought it at the time, the yeah. motion thing. I wouldn't think that anymore. I think it was the right thing to do. Definitely. I agree. Much so. <laughs> and is it, is it further information that's made you feel that? No. Or was it the emotion the at emotion the time? The emotion at the time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Emotion at the time. I think already the same evening, or you know, maybe the next day, I actually agree. Well, I understood and yeah, it was the right thing to do. Mm. It could have been very dangerous. The child was mm. in serious danger. Mm -hmm. and that's they why were both very drunk. And professionally, you have to be very careful of those emotions because it, yeah. you cannot let that get in the way of yeah. making a decision to keep a child safe. Mm -hmm. So you we have to be. It might, on the face of it, seem quite hard, but in fact, it's it's you know you do have to guard against those emotions. Okay, Ben, uh, Sam, have you got a question? If, if, yes, you have. Uh, we need to finish, but if if yeah. there are questions, if there are any any more questions, we've got about five more minutes. So five more minutes. Yeah. Oh, great. Good. Thank you for that. Uh, there was a question over here. Yeah, can we get, just get a mic over there? Okay. <coughs> it's for the record that mics, they want the mics so that they can hear. I was going to ask, would, um, has the experience taken into account both the emotional side of it for yourselves, not necessarily having experienced that kind of thing before, and perhaps the legal aspect of it, having to check everything three or four times before, has it put you off doing mm. anything like that again, or does it mean you've now, you've spent the whole thing kind of going, oh, we should be going down this avenue and looking here and, and following that storyline. Uh, so do you want to do more of it? or has It, it, it totally it? wiped me out. I was, fit, I was <laughs> spent at the end of it. I was really, really... And I have such admiration for what they do because what we experienced was a tiny fraction of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, and they yeah. go on and they go on, and it's quite remarkable. I don't know, I don't know how filmmakers like Brian do it, because you do back-to-back projects which is kind of very extreme and full on and really I, I found it took a huge amount out of me emotionally and physically and spiritually, the whole, I, I just felt wiped out. On the other hand, I, yeah, I absolutely go back, I really, undoubtedly, but I just... Would you be tempted to, to go back and find out what's happened to the people, it, you know, would you be tempted to go and do a two years on? Uh, hmm, I don't know, I've wondered that. Are there, there are other topics that have arisen from that kind of area yeah. that I'm really interested in exploring further. So, yes, I, I would go back, but with full batteries. <laughs> <laughs> Petra, you, I mean, you've done this, you did Staying Lost, Wasted, Great Ormond Street's very, well, very Well, I mean, you make a mistake to go on. Yeah. <laughs> Petra went straight from this on to Great Ormond Street, immediately. Uh, too much, too much. <laughs> I did another new Great Ormond Street after this and literally finished Friday and started on the Great Ormond Street and that was too much. Big mistake, but it's done. So how do you how do you handle the, the, the sort of Sorry. emotional roller coaster of it? How do you? <laughs> I do. I, I don't know. Um, if you sit up and down, it at does affect you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, by myself, <laughs> some <somewhere> sobbing. <laughs> no, uh, well, you have your up and downs, and uh, sometimes you cope, and other times you don't, and uh, sometimes it's tough on your closest ones as well <laughs> to listen to it. But yeah. And what know. about you, Brian? <laughs> You get a lot of phone calls. Yeah. <laughs> ben, this is what you're doing year in, year out. Mm. I mean, how do you and your colleagues deal with the emotional toll? I think we, you know, you have to be able to leave it behind if, if, if when you go home, you, if, you know, if you dwell on it um, 24 hours a day, you just wouldn't be able to do it. I think we got um, enormous amount of support within the profession. We haven't been particularly able to get that support from outside the pro profession, but I, I do think that's changing and, and the co programmes you know, significantly contributed towards that. But um, I think it is the teams, you know, the, the good solid management, and I think we enjoy that in Bristol. Um, and if you feel you've got that behind you, um, then it, you, can, you can manage it. You got any other questions? Yep, one over here. Um, just curious about the reruns of the programme. They come back and and um, say, look, I've, I know I said yes for the first time, but... Okay, so it's never, it can't, as part of the, the, the arrangement that we had at the beginning was never going to be used as archive, never going to be shown again, never going to be sold anywhere in the world. <laughs> it is one, it's just that that was up front, and it, even it going on iPlayer was a big thing about whether, you know, could it be allowed, on the, and so, yeah, no issues there. We, oh, up, the up front... Rushes have to be destroyed, which really, really breaks my heart. Because if we did want to go back in, in two or five years, that, that, 
And I'm not sure necessarily that's the right decision. It's interesting because they're, you know, if, if we're talking about, um, you know, Tiffany's children or any of the children involved in this who come to see it in 15 years' time, I think it would, wouldn't it be great if they could see all those rushes? Wouldn't it be um, you know, what an amazing testament? What an amazing, you know, adopted children often will wonder what happened in the past, and this would be an amazing way, potentially, of sharing them. But that's out of the question. As part of that protocol that we set out at the beginning, they will be destroyed. And so, likewise, along the way, if a judge had said, we or any of the professionals had said, this story has to stop, we're obliged to destroy those rushes. Which is Great. Thank you very much to the protecting of <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.